All right, good morning, everybody. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so we're gonna be giving a presentation on pharmacogenomic resources, what clinicians should know. Today, we'll be covering CPIC or the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. And then my colleague, Michelle Will Carrillo, um, will discuss at PharmGKB. And then we've got Kristen Cruz on here as well, who will be um, helping us with our questions and answers. So if you have a question, um, please put it in the Q&A box um, in, in, within the chat. All right, so CPIC, just a little bit about CPIC. Um, so CPIC was formed in 2009 to provide freely available evidence-based and updated pharmacogenetic clinical practice guidelines. Um, to date, we are a consortium. We have over 600 members from 260 institutions and 36 countries. We now have 26 guidelines. Um, most of these have been updated at least once or twice. Um, and we and now our guidelines cover 25 genes and over 90 drugs. So what is a CPIC guideline? So CPIC guideline answers one question. So I think when you're thinking about um, ordering a, a, a genetic test or how you interpret that genetic test, there's really two different questions. One is, should I order this test? But the other question and, and the question that the CPIC uh, guidelines answer is, should I use this pharmacogenomic result? And how do I use this result? So CPIC guidelines are really based on the assumption that the test results are in hand and not to discuss the merits of doing the test. Each CPIC guideline uses standardized formats. So I'm going to review kind of one very briefly today. Um, but you can, um, if you go look at another guideline, you'll see that they are very similar. Um, we have a system for grading the evidence and for grading our recommendations. These are peer reviewed, not only through the journal peer review process, but also we send this out to, yes, all 600 plus of our members. Um, these are freely available. Um, I'll, we'll be able to show you a few places today where you can find these guidelines. These are updated, as I mentioned. We do update these guidelines on an ongoing basis. And really, um, the evidence base grows every day. And so we do find a need to continuously um, review evidence to make sure our recommendations wouldn't change based on new evidence. We have a strict authorship policy for conflicts of interest. Um, because these do closely follow the IOM or the now, I guess, the National Academy of Medicine, um, standards for writing clinical practice guidelines. And so today we'll, we're really just giving just a really brief overview and just really telling you things that we think a clinician should know. But I do think it's important for you to understand the entire CPIC process. Um, and so here there's a, um, a reference down here where you can um, go and you can really see the entire SOP. Um, but we also do have a table in this where we align it with the standards from the clinical practice guidelines we can trust. And you'll see that we do align quite nicely with these. All right, so where do you find a CPIC guideline? You can go to CPIC, C-P-I-C-P-G-X.org. This will land you on our homepage. Um, there's lots of great resources on this, but again, today we're just doing a high level review. So we're gonna talk about the guidelines. So if you click on this tab up at the top, the guideline page, it will take you to a list of all of our guidelines. Again, we've got about 26 guidelines. So of course this list is much longer than I'm showing you here. Um, but we, you can click on each one of our guidelines. So let's say we wanted to click on, um, you know, one of CYP2C19 clopidogrel. We click here, even though I think my example is NSAIDs. Um, but it takes you to a guideline page um, for, the, for this example, NSAIDs, based on the CYP2C9 genotype. On this page, you can find our full PDF of the guideline and our supplement. And at the bottom of this page, you'll see a lot of other great resources, which I'll review here in a moment. So as I said, we have 26 guidelines that covers 25 genes um, and over 90 drugs. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, so I know this is a busy slide, but so this is all the genes and then the uh, drugs or the drug groups that we have uh, guidelines for. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is we do have a level called a no recommendation. Um, you'll note that when you order a pharmacogenomic test, and a lot of times you have a lot of genes on that, it's usually a panel of genes. However, not always are these considered what we consider actionable, which means you can act on this, you know, that genetic test result um, while prescribing. Um, and so we assign these a CPIC level C or no recommendation. And this means that our author group has gone through the entire process for the CPIC guidelines and is really deemed at this time with the current evidence, these are not considered actionable. So let's walk through a little bit about how to utilize the CPIC. And again, I'm just doing a very high level. So there's some details that we're gonna kind of leave out today. So I highly recommend that you at least go read at least one CPIC guideline so you can kind of get a feel for what's all included in each guideline. Um, but the important parts that you need to know, um, each um, recommendation in the guideline is based off of a phenotype. So a very important part of the CPIC guideline development process is the, the translation of this genotype to phenotype. And this is generally the table one in the guideline. I'll show you an example of this in a moment. 
Um, and then our table two or table three, depending on how many recommendations are in the um, guideline, um, will be our recommendation. So again, a big part of here is being able to understand and interpret that, that genetic um, test result that you might get from the laboratory. Um, so there's a lot of steps, but today we're really just going to focus on how do you get from that diplotype to the phenotype? Because I believe most laboratories are going to report out using this star allele nomenclature, which is really just a way to define haplotypes for pharmacogen pharmacogenes. Um, but again, we're just going to focus here because I think this is where a clinician needs to go. I don't think it's as important for you to really understand how we assign these diplotypes. However, there is a table in the guideline that really explains this process out and how we do um, assign a phenotype based on that diplotype. Um, but for you and for a busy clinician, I think this is where you can go. And I think also um, Michelle, when she starts uh, speaking here later, she's going to show you the better way that you can find these um, recommendations on PharmGKB. Um, so here I'm showing you the guideline page for clopidogrel and CYP2C19. Um, and again, I, I talked to you a little bit about those implementation resources that you have down here at the bottom of the page. I'm going to blow this up for you here. Um, so you can see here, we've got an entire translation table that translates every possible CYP2C19 diplotype to phenotype. Um, and there's a full table here. I think um, some genes have over 10,000 combinations. I can't remember exactly how many CYP2C19 has, but there are quite a few because this is a big file. Um, but really all you do is you find your diplotype on this um, table and um, here you go, here's your phenotype. So from our example, it was CYP2C19 star two star two. And we know that this individual is a poor metabolizer. So again, very important step. So now that you know what the phenotype of your patient is, and you come back to the guideline, and again, usually it's that table two, and you'll see here for a CYP2C19 poor metabolizer, if you were to prescribe clopidogrel, um, you would want to avoid that drug and use, um, use a different drug. Um, we also have a classification or really a strength of that recommendation, um, and you can see here, I'm going to point out some differences in some of our guidelines. Some of our guidelines are indication specific, so you can see that even though the recommendation is the same, um, the strength of the evidence is different because there's just a different evidence base for different indications for the drug. So what does that strong, moderate, optional, and no recommendation mean? So strong, this really is, we do have a system for um, grading the evidence. Um, so we found that the evidence is high, high quality, and that we think the desirable effects clearly outweigh the undesirable effects of using that information, that genetic information for prescribing. And then moderate is where we have a close or uncertain balance as to whether the evidence is high quality or desirable clearly outweigh the undesirable effects. And then we have optional recommendations um, where we feel like the desirable effects are really closely balanced with undesirable effects. Sometimes these, are, these recommendations are based on extrapolations um, or really the evidence base is weak, but really we, we think that you could use the information um, for prescribing, but it would be optional because there really are um, room for differences in opinion as to the need of the recommended course of action. And I talked to you a little bit about no recommendations here. So really, we found that there was really insufficient evidence, confidence, or agreement to provide a recommendation to guide clinical practice at the time of the guideline. All of our guidelines also have at least a paragraph on pediatric dosing. In some cases, there's enough evidence base where we can have a specific um, recommendation for the pediatric group. And so this I'm showing you here, our CYP2C19 Voriconazole guideline. And you can see here we have a specific, we, there's another table for adults, and then we have one for pediatrics. And this kind of gets me to my next point. If you know that your patient's a CYP2C19 for metabolizer, for example, you also need to know that you may be just prescribing clopidogrel, but the patient needs to know about this result because, of course, there's uh, several drugs that are impacted by CYP2C19 variation. So just wanted to conclude here and big things. So again, big picture here. I highly recommend you go pull a CPIC guideline, get yourself familiar with it. But once you familiarize yourself with one CPIC guideline, they're all pretty standard moving forward. Um, and again, I use some basic um, examples here for drug metabolizing enzymes. So there are quite a few caveats for some other genes, but really just wanted to give a high level um, report to you today. Um, but really was just to remind you to be you know, mindful of some limitations. So the genotype to phenotype translation, sometimes you might get back that genetic test result and they've actually um, translated that genotype to a phenotype for you. But if you're going to be using a CPIC guideline for your recommendations, you need to make sure that they've translated the way CPIC translates it. So you still wanna jump on um, online and, and make sure that, you know, if they're calling them a poor metabolizer, that CPIC also calls them a poor metabolizer. Um, and we're getting a little bit, or, little bit better in that area, but um, I have seen some lab reports recently that, that they're not really using CPIC standard translations. Um, what does STAR1 mean? Um, so STAR1 is really what we consider wild type or the reference. 
In most cases, this means the patient is more of a normal function. But remember that in most cases, that the, your genotype result is from targeted uh, genotyping testing, um, which focuses on interrogating previously described um, star alleles and sometimes not even all of those. So you just have to make sure that you understand that it's not really designed to detect novel variants. Um, there could be rare allelic variants that may not be included in that genotype test, and the patients um, with these rare variants may be assigned a normal metabolizer phenotype by default. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and with that being said, too, pharmacogenomic results really should not be used in a vacuum because they really only count for genetic variability to drug response. And as you know, there's lots of things like drug interactions, um, kidney function, liver function, and, and other things that can really um, cause variability in drug metabolism. So with that, I finish up and I'm gonna hand this over to my colleague, Michelle. And start my slides. Okay, so yeah. So I'm going to build on what Kelly talked about um, with the CPIC um, uh, group and talk about the pharmacogenomics knowledge base, otherwise known as PharmGKB. Um, PharmGKB is the largest resource of freely available pharmacogenomic information out there. And our mission is to be everything a PGX. And we're financially supported by the NIH, uh, specifically NHGRI. So here is a homepage um, of our website. Um, we're at www.farmtkb.org. Please feel free to jump on and, and follow along if you'd like, or please check us out at some point. Um, the homepage is really long. You'd have to scroll down to see all of it. Um, you can take a tour of the homepage. It will show you all the different sections of the homepage when you have a chance. And to learn more about pharmacogenomics in general on our homepage, we have this green button right here. So if you click that, it takes you to a page that has information that you can navigate through in um, basically bite-sized chunks uh, from basic genetics to more details about how genetic interactions, um, how genetics interact with medicine. And there is an FAQ for clinicians that you, can, um, that you can go view. It's mainly regarding pharmacogenomic testing, how to order tests and what to do with test results. A little bit about what Kelly already talked about with test results. And I would like to point out that at the top left-hand um, corner of every PharmGKB webpage, there's this um, icon with PharmGKB and you can click it, it will take you right back to our homepage. So let's pretend like I click that and back on the homepage, we have another section that I'd like to just point out. Um, that describes the specific types of information you can find on PharmGKB. Um, we do have a tour, an automated tour of the website that you can follow along um, and documentation on how to search on PharmGKB. And we also provide an overview of the different types of information on the website. Much of what I can't cover here today, I'm only gonna cover a little bit about prescribing information and drug labels. But if you forget what I talk about today, you can always come back to this page um, for a reminder. So there are three main sources of information on PharmGKB. Um, we curate peer-reviewed published literature, um, information from studies um, including clinical outcome studies, pharmacokinetic studies, and more. We also um, curate regulatory agency approved drug labels, which often contain unpublished data. And uh, lastly, published pharmacogenomic guidelines, like the ones from CPEC that you just heard about from Kelly. I'm um, gonna talk about each of these three um, kind of in reverse order. So guidelines first. So guidelines annotated at PharmGKB come from a variety of sources, but the main two sources are, um, sorry, go, need to go back, are CPIC, which um, Kelly just talked to you about uh, a little bit about, and also the Royal Dutch Pharmacists Association Dutch Pharmacogenetics Working Group, which is a mouthful, we just call them DPWG. So like I said, there are various groups that um, have published um, different pharmacogenomics related guidelines, but CPIC um, produces the majority of them. PharmGKB uh, partners with CPIC to be um, upfront about that, but also the Stutch group um, produces quite a few guidelines as well. So we highlight both of these on PharmGKB. So on the PharmGKB homepage, you can click the clinical guideline annotation button and that will take you to the landing page for all these clinical guideline annotations. And you see we have a column for CPIC, a column for the Dutch group, and then a column for others. And at the top of the page, you can read more about our process for curating the guidelines. But the table down below is really long and you can filter and search based on the source of the guideline and what type of information is in the guidelines, such as guidelines where a dosing change is recommended based on the phenotype or phenotype, or if a different drug is recommended. 
So if I sort this list, if I filter for CPIC guidelines and, um, and say ones that recommend dose and change based on genotype, I get this list and I can find out more information about any of the guidelines by, um, in this table by clicking on it. And I'm gonna show you an example today for amitriptyline. And this is the PharmGKB annotation page for the CPIC guideline for amitriptyline and CYP2C19 and CYP2D6 from the TCA guideline. We provide a video overview of the information in the guideline. Um, we do encourage everyone to read those manuscripts put out by CPIC um, in its entirety, but sometimes people just um, want a, like a brief introduction before they uh, read the entire manuscript and these videos will give them that. Um, we also have a place for users to enter particular genotypes. So um, you can use these pull down menus to select the genotype for diplotypes that maybe you got as like a test result that you got back from a pharma pharmacogenomic test. Um, Kelly talked about, you know, these star alleles and you can enter these um, diplotypes here in this pull down menu. And what happens is we will retrieve the, um, from CPICS database, the specifics of the guideline, including the recommendation for that specific, um, for those specific genotypes. So this guideline um, is focused on uh, uh, genotypes from two genes, both CYP2C19 and CYP2D6. So this way the user doesn't have to map across all those files that Kelly mentioned. Um, it's kind of done for you here on PharmGKB. So um, it's a nice way to kind of access that information quickly without having to, um, to map through all the tables on the back end. Not everybody has like an informatics group to do that. However, that being said, all those tables that she mentioned are really important. And if you scroll down that page on PharmGKB, you would see links to all those tables. Um, just like you see them on the CPIC website, you can also get um, access to the uh, manuscript itself and the supplementary information on PharmGKB. So we have similar pages for the Dutch group, um, same kind of mechanism where you can enter a genotype. The only thing that is missing is we don't have the videos for the um, Dutch guidelines. So I'm gonna switch gears to drug labels. Um, we curate from a variety of sources, but we start with FDA approved drug labels um, listed on their pharmacogenomic biomarkers table. And then we try to find matching labels from EMA in Canada when we can. I will say that we have some labels from Japan and Switzerland on our website as well, but those were collaborations where we had colleagues help translate the labels for us, so we can't maintain those regularly. So on the home page, you can click on the drug label annotations link to get to the landing page there. And at the top again, you can learn more about our curation process. But like with the guidelines, we have ways to sort these label annotations. Um, this FDA biomarker um, sorter tag it just refers to the FDA's pharmacogenomic biomarkers and drug labeling table, which provides a list of labels identified by FDA that has some kind of gene on them. And these table, this table from FDA has the drug and the gene and the section of the label that there's some information on, but it's up to the user to basically read through it and, um, and understand what type of information is on that label. But PharmGKB basically is doing that for the, for the user here. So you can query and sort um, uh, based on um, the uh, source of the label um, using this bar. And I wanna point out these different colored tags, the different colored tags like red for testing required or green for actionable PGX refer to the label content. So that's the part where PharmGKB goes in and pulls out that information regarding the gene on the label. So to be clear, PharmGKB only curates drug labels that have gene or variant information on them. We don't curate every single label, but the ones that we identify with gene information, we do tag um, based on whether the label says that some kind of testing is required or recommended. Most say nothing about um, pharmacogenomics testing at all, but they might contain some actions like dosage suggestions, and that would be an actionable PGX tag. And some refer only to the gene, but make no mention of how it would affect prescribing at all, and they would get an informative tag. And if you, um, if you uh, are, look at our, our website for these annotations, we, all, we have links on every page um, with, the, with the drug label annotations that take you to the legend to explain exactly how we put these tags on, on, the, um, on the label annotations. So here's an example. If you click on an annotation from the landing page that I showed earlier, as an example of an annotation here from FDA. In this case, the label is on the FDA biomarker list. 
its tag was testing recommended because of language from the leg label. There's a quote down here that says, um, testing should be considered in certain populations. So that's why it's got that tag. It's also tagged with prescribing info, specifically alternate drugs, based on, again, language from the label saying that the drug should be avoided in patients with a specific variation, in this case, HLA-B1502. So the drug's contraindicated in that population, and that's what we mean by alternate drugs. And finally, on every label annotation, if you can look here way down at the bottom, there is a link to download the PDF of the drug label that we curated that we got the information from and the relevant information is highlighted for the user there. So if you're interested in FDA labels in particular, you could scroll down the home page here and click on this link for FDA drug label annotations. This takes you to a table just for FDA approved drug label annotations and I'm going to zoom on in on it quickly. And you can see we have a lot more columns here available to, to see if, for example, a variant is mentioned um, on the label. Most labels don't have a variant, but if they do, it's listed here in the column for you. You can sort based on whether or not the label is on the FDA biomarker list. Sometimes they go off mysteriously or on this biomarker list, and we keep track of that for you. The FDA also started another list a few years ago called the Table of Pharmacogenetic Associations. Um, they, they started this list. It's actually three tables in one. Um, the tables kind of sort gene drug pairs based on um, how they feel it meets different criteria. So PharmGKB does curate all the information from these lists as well, and you can sort on the website, um, on our website, based on, based on those FDA tables. You can also sort based on the, um, the level and the tags that I talked about earlier. As a note, um, FDA's biomarker table and their PGX association table so those are two different tables. They don't always agree. They don't, um, sometimes, most of the time they align, but sometimes they don't. Just as a quick example, um, this particular label for amphetamine is on the biomarker list. However, on the label, there's very little about anything about PGX. The most it says is that the 2D6 basically metabolizes the drug. Um, that's why I got the informative tag. However, on their other table of pharmacogenetic associations, they actually have instructions here about um, you could consider lowering a starting dose or using an alternative agent if, you, um, if your patient is a tip 2D6 poor metabolizer. So how that information is sorted out, um, it's, it's unclear to, at this time, but you can compare and contrast that on PharmGKB. And I mentioned a little bit earlier that PharmGKB curates scientific literature like this paper from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, we use standardized terminologies and collect study information from each article. Um, we curate bunches and bunches of articles. We have thousands curated on our website, and we try to aggregate this information across all the articles we curate. We add in information from the drug labels and the guidelines when possible, and use all this information to create graded genotype drug summaries that we call clinical annotations. These annotations are graded based on the amount of evidence that we have collected to support the association. You can read more about it, but basically a level 1A means that that um, association has the support of a drug label or a guideline, but the value of the clinical annotations is really when there's not a guideline or a drug label available, but you want to know more about a particular variant drug association because maybe you got it returned on a pharmacogenomic a test, for example, you may have a test result about it, but if there's no um, guideline or drug label, you can use PharmGKB's clinical annotations to see what evidence we have found um, for, uh, for such an association, and you can find these annotations by typing a gene or a drug name in the search box on our website, going to the corresponding page, and clicking on the clinical annotations link on the left-hand side, and the table would be here for you. So I'm out of time, but I wanted to point out two more possibly helpful resources um, for those of you who would like to dig deeper into pharmacogenomics. FarmCat is a PGX tool that takes patient genotype and sequencing results and VCF file assigns diplotypes and phenotypes like Kelly had mentioned earlier, and then provides the CPIC and DPWD dosing guidelines in a report for format. And PharmVar is a central repository for pharmacogene uh, gene variation. It maintains the nomenclature for all of those star alleles for the cytochrome P450s and other pharmacogenes. Um, it's an invaluable resource. And while it may not appear as relevant to clinical implementation as the guidelines do, the guidelines absolutely depend on this nomenclature. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, here are all the people associated with all of these projects. Um, these are all my colleagues and uh, these resources couldn't exist without them. Thank you.
Okay, well, thank you to our two presenters. Thank you both for your presentations. Our, um, our question and answer session is open. You can feel free to type in a question for either of our presenters. And so I have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first one is for Dr. Caudill about CPIC. How often are CPIC guidelines updated? So yeah, I kind of mentioned before they're updated on it. We try to update on an ongoing basis, trying to keep up with the evidence base. But I would say each guideline needs to be at least reviewed by our authors at least every five years. And that keeps us with, within those standards for the IOM for um, writing guidelines that we can trust. Um, however, I will say there's some guidelines like, I don't know, the HLA and carbamazepine. It's a very clear example of if a patient has this variant, don't use the drug. And so more evidence to this might make it a stronger recommendation, but it really won't change the recommendation itself. Um, and so in those cases, those guidelines might be, you know, they may actually go the full five, six, seven years before we do update them. Um, but others where like in any kind of like the SSRI guideline or um, in antidepressants or antipsychotic, when, once we get that one done, um, those are that evidence base is growing every day. So those probably will be updated more often. Great. Thank you. I have another question that um, really uh, talks to the process of assigning phenotype based on genotype. So is it there a prescribed process for that? Yes. And so we have a full SOP um, just written for this. So I, I mentioned that, you know, some of that that I left off um, for time wise, we have one process where so you have that allele. It's, um, we use FarmVar um, to help uh, define what that allele is, so that star allele. And then we assign a function to it. So it's either increased function, normal function, decreased function, or no function. Those terms are standardized. And then that phenotype is really based on the combination of those two genotypes. So a patient who has that star two, star two, for example, they have two no function alleles. And because of this, they are a poor metabolizer. But if they had one normal function allele and one no function allele, they would then be an intermediate metabolizer. And another thing to note too, is these can differ. These assignments can differ by gene, right? So one thing to note, a STAR2 for CYP2C19 is not the same as a STAR2 for CYP2D6. Um, and the functions can change. And actually CYP2D6 and CYP2C19 actually use different definitions for that genotype to phenotype. So it's really important that you're pulling the correct gene tables when you're utilizing those genes. Great question, Chris, thanks. <laughs> Very good. And that sort of leads into um, the next question, because this is Genomics Education Week. So um, are there resources for educating clinicians more, more in depth about how to interpret these results? Yes, there, there are actually quite a few. And one I want to point out, because there is a talk this afternoon um, at one o'clock Eastern time that I really hope that you, you can join, because I think it will go over a lot of resources that you can have. And I'm reading this. I apologize because it's a mouthful, the NIH Inter-Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics, or ISCC-PEG. Um, they've got a learning series that they'll be discussing this afternoon, but they're new peer-reviewed online education for healthcare professionals. Um, I'm excited to dig into these, even as a, as, a, as a pharmacogenomics expert, I still can't wait to see what they put together. So I hope others do um, take the time to, to take some of these um, courses they put together. Excellent. Uh, we just had a question come in, and this one is for Dr. Will Carrillo. Um, will there be an option someday through PharmGKB to create a CPIC adherent patient-specific report with medication recommendations similar to what we see in a commercial pharmacogenomics report? Yeah, so, you know, PharmGKB is basically research-based, but we, we are working, we're just about to release um, a tool on the website which you can enter the genotypes through those pull down menus, like I said, for like all the genes that you might have information for from a test result. And it can pull up all the CPIC um, recommendations um, for, you know, because if you have CYP2C9, that could apply to multiple guidelines, CYP2C19 results apply to multiple guidelines. So if you enter those into this landing page, you'll pull up all the um, recommendations specific for those genotypes that are entered. Um, so it's, um, uh, it won't be quite the same, uh, I think, type of report as a commercial PGX report, but it is going to be a report that um, that's specific for that patient that's um, really using exactly what's in the CPIC database. So the nice thing about PharmGKB and CPIC is they work hand in hand. Um, we're kind of one 
big team there. And so the stuff that you pull on Farm TKB is exactly what's in the CPIC guidelines and in the database. That's wonderful. That's really good news. Um, so one other question, and um, this is really, uh, Dr. Caldwell, you, you, you touched on the STAR-1 variant issue. And so um, for the, a real case scenario of a clinician who gets back a report, um, the clinician, where can the clinician go to evaluate whether the variants reported back are, represent the full list of variants that should be interrogated? So AMP has put together, they've got a working group where they, um, where Michelle may be the better person because she's involved in each one of these, <laughs> um, but they, um, they put together a list of variants that they think must be tested. There's a tier one and tier two. Um, I think these are all publications in themselves, so you can go to PubMed and probably easily find these recommendations or the AMP website. I'm sure they have them. Um, but they've got these. They're tables. also on Farm GKB. Oh, and, and on Farm GK, Farm GKB has everything. <laughs> it's a one-stop shopping there. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's a great list. I do recommend that you do the tier one and tier two. I think that's. Um, I think that would be recommended these days. Um, but they did base some of that off of um, the, the availability of reference. So there's a lot of things that went into those decisions about the testing and which alleles to include. But I think most laboratories should be doing tier one and tier two. Um, we have. A several more questions coming in. Um, so regarding back to the report on Farm GKB um, that we just discussed, will that report be patient friendly also as well as provider oriented? So the initial release is going to be more um, yeah, researcher or provided or provider oriented, not really um, uh, for patients directly yet. Mm -hmm. But that's that's really an important issue because so much of healthcare is going, you know, is becoming transparent, right? With patient um, uh, patient friendly lab results available on my chart, for example. So, and, you know, and absolutely. patients are getting to, absolutely we'll, patients are getting. So yeah, we'll have to work on that just because it's more of language issues. So it's making sure that we're using language that's appropriate. Okay, there is a question: um, Are there online free pharmacogenomic courses for basic pharmacogenomics that are recommended? I know there's a lot of certificate programs out there. I'm not certain how many of them are virtual versus um, in person, but I do believe you do pay for all of them. Um, I believe the ISCC PEG um, resources, though, are, gonna, are free. Um, and I do believe it's it's pretty basic on to the more advanced. So I think that would be a great place to start. Um, and St. Jude also has a website where we also have um, uh, competencies that are, I think, really great and easy to um, access as well. Um, and those are also freely available. Uh, one more question. This is, is there a recommended timeline for introducing mandatory mandatory pharmacogenomic training into medical school curriculum? I really think pharmacogenomics should be really integrated into any pharmacology class. Um, I don't know how much uh, of that the medical students get, um, but they certainly need to be learning a bit more about pharmacogenomics within their curriculum. Um, it's being taught in pharmacy schools now, sometimes within the curriculum, but then sometimes it's um, a, a course on its own. Um, but either way, it, it really needs to be worked in those didactic classes, in, in my opinion, um, that we're slowly getting there, I think. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our questions coming in from our attendees. If you have any more questions, go ahead and type them now. Okay, seeing none, I think that's the end of our Q&A. Right. Thank you well, so thank much, you. Chris. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Um, and I, if you, you have any questions or anything, please, please feel free to reach out to CPIC or, or Farm GKB. We both have links on our website where you can um, submit questions.